Well, good morning. Uh, this is the adult Sunday school class of Madison Baptist Church. So glad you've joined us. Uh, we're in the book of Philippians. So get your Bible, get a pen and paper, get ready to be involved and receive from the Lord from His Word. Hey, this morning, we're going to be taking uh, two steps backwards, but never fear, we're going to be taking three steps forward. <laughs> Okay, we plan on finishing the third chapter of the book of Philippians today, and we'll see how that goes. But I think we can do that. I know we can. I have a plan to do that. Uh, but to do that, in order to do that, we need to back up and see what the chapter was all about if we're going to end up with it. And it ends up gloriously. And as we get to that last verse, you'll see exactly what I mean. So I'm glad you're with us this morning, this Lord's Day. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Before we proceed any further, let's just bow in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we bow before you, oh God, we'd ask you to do what man cannot do. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us throughout uh, this uh, special week we've had, Lord, through your word over and over again. We submit and commit ourselves to you, the Holy One. We'd ask you now, Lord, that you'd take us through this third chapter of the book of Philippians to give understanding and wisdom and application to our lives. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, uh, again, Philippians chapter 3. Uh, we're, going to be, we're going to be looking in Philippians chapter 3 uh, at some verses before uh, the verses that we're actually going to study. Take a, take a look, if you would, please, with me in verse 9. Chapter 3, verse 9 says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now, that's the clue. That's the key. This matter of righteousness of God by faith. Why is he saying that? And again, we've come through this, but I want to get your minds uh, focused back on. He says that because there's Judaizers up in verse 2. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. These people were teaching that salvation uh, comes by mutilating the flesh. It wasn't a circumcision of the heart. Uh, that Abraham had, and a physical circumcision as well, and that the true Jews who trusted God for salvation had, but they, had, they were walking in the flesh and working in the flesh. So he says now, let's have the righteousness which is by faith, with, of God which is by faith, by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why he says in verse 10, that I may know him, that, that righteousness of faith, so we can know him. So we can come to salvation. And uh, that's kind of the background that we're going to be uh, looking at. Hey, let's go to our memory verses right now because we're right there, aren't we? In chapter 3, verse 10 is our memory verse, and we'll go through that right now. Uh, Philippians 3.10. Let's say that together. Philippians 3.10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Philippians 3.10. Hey, in this verse, uh, we, have, we have salvation. Uh, we have the working of God separating us in, unto himself. Uh, we have the, the knowledge of the resurrection. As Jesus died and rose again, Likewise here, except he come in the air and take us and raise us and change us sometime before our death. And we're looking forward to that. It could be any moment, any time, uh, and then uh, being made conformable unto Christ. That's what he has foreordained that we should be in the likeness of our Savior, in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Well, we won't be preaching through that again. Uh, last week, someone said, hey, uh, you stopped teaching and you started preaching. <laughs> well, I think they're closely akin. I'm trying to teach. Uh, pray for me as a teacher that I can teach and not just preach. But I'm telling you, this is powerful truth. So, again, let's go over our memory verse one more time. Then we'll hit our next memory verse. Again, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings 
being made conformable unto his death. Philippians 3.10. All right, very good. And then our other memory verse is verse 14, chapter 3, verse 14. And uh, we're going to read some other verses in just a second to get us up to there because we've read to verse 10. But let's go ahead and quote this together, the reference, the verse, and the reference. Philippians 3, 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3.14. Very good. I hope you're saying these together with us. Just by going over these and over these, God's using the Word of God to cleanse our hearts, to cleanse our minds, and uh, to give us a focus on what He wants us to know. Let's say it one more time. Philippians 3.14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3.14. Very, very good. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, we have, we have uh, gone through now this chapter, and we're in three phases in this chapter, all right? And we have, first of all, his warning. Again, the Judaizers in verses 1 and 2, there was the warning, beware, beware, beware. <laughs> Uh, the dogs, the evil workers, the, con the, the concision. And then we saw in verses 3 through 13, his witness. Oh, the, uh, the witness of his focus, the witness of his faithfulness, the witness of his fellowship. All through these, uh, these verses, uh, through verse 13, his witness. Now, from verse 14 through verse 21, which is the end of the chapter, through verse 14 through verse 21, we're going to be seeing his walk his walk and how clear his walk is and what kind of a walk should we walk as the apostle Paul walked well he's going to give us some instruction in that right now if you'll look back to your bible again uh, if you look back there uh, let's let's take a look at, at verse at t uh, verse 10 again he says oh that that I may know him based on the uh, on the righteousness which is by faith in Jesus Christ based on that righteousness that I may know him in salvation and uh, the power of his resurrection that comes with salvation uh, and the fellowship of his sufferings that comes along with it, doesn't it? And uh, being made conformable unto his death, verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, now what kind of a quality is he going to have in his resurrection? And not as though as I had already attained, either already perfect, but I follow after, and that was the fellowship of his following, that if I may apprehend that for, for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Jesus was, was, was catching him, was, was reaching out to him, was, was, was calling for him for the same reason that Paul was seeking Christ. And by the way, that works in you and I the same way as we've said before. And then verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, the, uh, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then he says, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this unto you. Now, here's a question for you. We go back to verse 14. Does the runner compete for the, pro, for, the, for the mark or the prize? That's a good question, isn't it? When someone is in competition, are, are, are they competing for the mark? That is, if there's a, a string uh, across the finish line, are they competing for that string? <laughs> is that what they want? Yeah, they do want that, but that's not what they're competing for. They're competing for the prize. And so in verse 14, when he says, I press for the mark of the, for the prize. I, say, I press toward the, the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. That's, that's the prize, the high calling of God. And he's pressing towards the prize. In other words, he's pressing towards that mark in anticipation for the prize. And he's anticipating that prize. Oh, the mark is closing our eyes in this life, opening them up in the next life, and then that resurrection, the, the bodily resurrection of the believer. 
Oh, my dear friends, that's the prize. Uh, the mark is the end of the life. And the apostle Paul came to his end. We are coming to ours. Is it going to count for the Lord? Remember what he said in, uh, in, the, in 2 Timothy chapter 4? Let me read the entire verse. He says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. There it is. There's the prize. Do you see the, the mark? And now do you see the prize? He says, There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the rest of the verse, as Paul Harvey might say, the rest of the story is the best part of it because it includes you and I, every believer in Christ. He says, and not only for me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Are you looking forward to Jesus coming or are you dreading that day? Oh, let it not be a dread. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let him cleanse you. Let him purify you. Don't go anticipating doom or loss of reward, but looking forward to that wonderful crown of glory that he'll give to each one of us who anticipate and love his coming. And he is coming again. He likens, again, life to a race that is run. Let me remind you in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 26, the apostle Paul is telling us what his life is like and what our life in Christ is. And we're running a race. And guess what? Uh, we're all running. And it's not if we're running, it's we are in the race. So now how are you going to run? That's the question. Listen to what he says in, in that passage in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 24, he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, everyone run. That's no big deal to be running. That's part of it. As soon as you get saved, you're in the race. He says, But one receiveth the prize. Well, what's the prize? Oh, my dear friends, watch. So run that you may obtain. That's how we're to do. We're to run to obtain the prize. Only one winner. And we're to strive, we're to, we're to reach. Uh, and he says, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a, a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not one as beateth the air. Are you with me? Yeah, I press toward the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Woo! It kind of comes together, doesn't it? Well, uh, that's what God is doing. Hey, uh, here's, the, here's the purpose for our quality of a resurrection. And, and this tells us much. In, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 35, listen to what the Lord says. In Hebrews eleven thirty-five, 35, he says, Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Well, why would they do that? The last part of that verse, that they might obtain a better resurrection. How about you? Are you striving to obtain a better resurrection? You mean there'll be some resurrections that are better than others? Oh, yes. All of us will receive a bodily resurrection. All of us will be in the image of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but others will lose reward where some will gain reward. How about you? It depends on how our race on this earth, our time, our life is spent for him. Isn't that something? He says in verse 15, he says, Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. What kind of a mind? What's he talking about here? Verse 14 the Apostle Paul, he, he, was, he was pressing toward the mark uh, for the prize of the high calling of God. He had put those things behind him, those things that, that earthly gain, uh, those things of the world that, that say that they're profitable. He counted them as done. Hey, that's the mind that we're to have. Let us therefore, be as many as be perfect, be thus minded. 
Now, how about you? Are you thus minded? How about me? Oh, over and again. The more I get into God's word, the more the preaching, the more I submit to him, the more I surrender to him, the more I yield to him, the more I realize that I'm not thus minded. That so many times I'm earthly minded. I'm not mindful of heavenly things, of true things. Here's another question. Are you pressing toward the mark? Are you pressing toward it? Do you know Christ is your Savior? You're in the race. Now, are you just simply walking while others are running? Or are you serving Him with diligence and with all your heart? Are you pressing toward the mark? Press. Pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then he says, uh, again in verse 15, Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded, and if anything be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this unto you. Nevertheless, he says, whereunto we have already attained, watch, verse 16, this is the walk of example. He says, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. What he's talking about here is, listen, uh, the, the Apostle Paul was pressing. Hey, do you have that mind? Uh, uh, is that mind in you? And he says, let us walk by that same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Do you? Do you, do you, do you walk by the same rule? Is your life like the Apostle Paul's life, is your life one of crucifixion, one of relating to him, one of sacrifice, one of laying your life down, one of living for him? Do you mind the same things? He says in verse 17, brethren, I like that, and those who he is writing to in the, in the book of Philippians, they were his brethren, they, they knew him well, but he was brothers in Christ with them. Listen, we are brothers together and we are brethren with the Apostle Paul. Although he's in heaven waiting for that glorious appearing of Christ when the resurrection shall take place, he's in heaven with the Lord. Listen, we're still brethren and he's, he's talking to us today. He says, brethren, be followers together of me. Be followers together of me. Uh, this word together, so many times I see that. And when you see that together, I want you to think assembly. I want you to think church. I want you to think body of Christ, all right? He's calling us brethren. Hey, we are united. We're brothers. We have the same Father, the God of heaven. We're born again. And so he says brethren, and not just those whom he knows, but those of us who he's never met, but we have that fellowship because we have that oneness in Christ. Brethren, be followers together. Let's go, let's do this together. This is a corporate action, not just an individual action. Action. It's yes, us and the Apostle Paul coming with Jesus Christ, but it's together at the church, the body of believers. Be followers together of me. The Apostle Paul is saying, hey, uh, follow me. Look across the page. You're still there in Philippians chapter 3. In my Bible, it's just across the page. Look at chapter 4, verse 9. Look at chapter 4, verse 9. And obviously, we'll cover this again in a couple of weeks in this particular verse. But he says, Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Did you catch that? He wants us to be followers of him as he follows Christ. And he, he kind of puts it in reverse order. Those things which you have both learned, received, heard, and seen do. You can kind of back that up backwards. Hey, we see what the Apostle Paul's done. We hear about what the Apostle's done. We believe it and receive what the Apostle Paul's done. We've learned it by experience. And by the way, if behavior hasn't changed, learning hasn't taken place. Did you catch that? Hey, as a teacher, uh, I learned many years ago, uh, someone hasn't learned what you're trying to teach them, and you haven't taught 
until behavior has changed. And when the behavior has changed, there's learning that's taking place. He says, hey, you do all that. Do it. And the God of peace shall be with you. He he doesn't stop there in, in, in verse 17. Notice what he says. Brethren, be followers together of me. And then he says, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. We're to mark them. We're to take note of them. Now, that doesn't mean put a big mark on the back or on their forehead (laughs) or on their chest and mark them. What he's talking about is take note of those who are examples for you. He says, be a followers uh, together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. Not have me for an example, but us. It was more than the Apostle Paul. Hey, remember all of the Apostles, uh, all of his team all of his team members, all the missionaries, all the helpers, all those who came to his aid, all those who were going out preaching the gospel with him. Uh, and we go through the scriptures and you know, look at the end of some of these books, like the end of Romans, uh, even the end of this book, uh, the end of the other epistles of, of the apostle Paul. And by the way, an epistle is, is not the wife of an apostle. That's, that's a common mistake, okay? <laughs> An epistle is the letter, all right? So all the epistles of the Apostle Paul, that's a mouthful. Uh, they have a list of those who are laboring together with him and what faithful ones they were. He says, they, those are the examples for you to mark. Take a look at them. By the way, we have, those, we have examples today in our own church. And uh, let, let me just sh- share with, you know, with what... 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 says. Are you with me? You can turn there if you want, but I'm going to read it to you. He says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, he's Peter, who who has just announced in the the first verse that he is an elder, he is a pastor, just like those he's writing to. He says, I'm a pastor too. He says, now, I'm going to tell you something. And by the way, it's exactly what Jesus told him after his resurrection and after Peter says, I go fishing. Jesus told him before, yeah, I'll make you become a fisherman of men. And he says, no, I'm going to go fishing. And uh, he was defeated. He, was, he had uh, the, 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 the poochie lip, if you please. He went fishing, caught nothing. He saw Jesus. And then Jesus, when he came to shore, asked him, Peter, lovest thou me more than these, more than these stinky fish, <laughs> more than anything else? Oh, yes, Lord, I, I love you. Lovest thou me? He asked him three times. Jesus continually said, feed my sheep. The first time he said, feed my lambs. Then he said, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Well, listen to what he says in 1 Peter 5, 2. He says, Peter speaking to, to the other elders, to, the, to others who are like him, a pastor. He says, feed the flock of God which is among you. Well, that's a good idea. That's exactly what Jesus said. Feed the flock of God, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not of filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, watch, but being in samples to the flock. That's an interesting word, being in samples to the flock. The same thing that he says here in in verse 17, in chapter 3, verse 17 of Philippians. He says, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an in sample. And in sample, he says in, in Psalm 37, 37, in good verse, Psalm 37, 37, good, good chapter, by the way, good chapter to meditate and memorize through. Uh, excellent. One of my favorite uh, Psalms. And he says, mark the perfect man. That means take notice, mentally mark him, uh, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. It's peace. Well, why in the world is an ensample? Uh, I'm going to make an ensample of you. Uh, that's exactly right. That's a good use of the word because it simply means an example. Literally, it means a fashion or to make a figure of or to form a pattern for. It simply means an example, all right? So when the, the uh, King James English uses the word ensample, it simply means example. And uh, mark them as examples. Now, Peter has already told us that 
uh, the pastors are to feed the flock, and they are to be examples to others, examples for others to follow. Uh, listen to what Hebrews 13.7 says. Hebrews 13.7 says, Remember them that have the rule over you. I'm not talking about the governors or the mayors or the city councilmen or the president or the um, Congress. He says, Remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. We're to consider them. Hey, they're our examples, aren't they? Our pastors, that's exactly what it's talking about. Our pastor is our example. He says in, in that same chapter, verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Now, we have examples and we have in samples for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. As the Apostle Paul follows Christ, we're to follow the same way. As our pastor follows Christ, we're to submit ourselves and follow him that very same way. Wives, follow your husbands as they follow Christ. Children, follow your parents as they follow Christ. That's only right. That's only true. Again, verse 17, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which, which walk so as you have us for in samples. Then verse, that's so positive, isn't it? <laughs> that's the good news. Now for the bad news. That was positive. Now for the negative. Look at verse 18. Verse 18, he says, for many. For means, here's the reason why. Here's, here's why you're to follow me as I follow Christ. Here, here's why you're to, to mark those who are examples for you. Pay attention to them. Follow them. Here's why. Verse 18 for many walk, not just some, many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. There are those who are enemies of the cross. Now, um, I like Paul's attitude in this verse, in, in verse 18. And now this, we're talking about the, the walk of the enemies. He says, for many walk of whom I have told you often. Now, this is his first letter that's, that, that we have, the only letter that we have to the people at Philippi. But remember, he spent time there. He's, he started the church there. He led many of the people to Christ there. He's been there more than once, and they've helped him more than once. So he's told them, he's preached to them before, and he's told them often. And he says, now I tell you weeping. Doesn't that tell you a lot about his attitude, about his heart? about his heart for those who have erred from the truth, about his heart towards those who need to hold to the truth. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of Christ. Who are these enemies? Who is he talking about now? Well, if we're in the same chapter that we started out in with, chapter, with verse 1 and 2, and that's who he's talking about. Uh, those who are the, the enemies of Christ are the dogs, the evil workers, <laughs> the concision. Again, verse 2, he says, beware of dogs. Remember, we said that dogs aren't the household pets. Uh, they, aren't the, the, they aren't the little cuddly things that you like to pet on the head and give them a treat and go take a walk with. No, dogs in, 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 in uh, Eastern uh, world and still is, and in Paul's day especially, they were scoundrels. Uh, they would walk the cities and, and uh, about at night and howl and, and fight. And uh, it's the, it, he's describing the same people, by the way. Dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Concision are those who mutilate the flesh. And they were calling for circumcision by salvation. He says, beware. Hey, listen, these are enemies of the cross. Now, wait, wait a minute. Just simply because they were, they were requiring Believers are telling believers that they had to be circumcised to keep their, uh, their salvation? Absolutely. They are absolute enemies of the cross. I'll tell you who the enemies of the cross are, 
And by the way, we still have them today. And they are many. They are not few. They are many. Those who were enemies of the cross are those who would pervert the precious and pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. His death, his burial, his resurrection, sufficient once for all. Nothing else added to it. Those who would, who would pervert the gospel are those who would add works to the gospel. Oh yes, we believe in Christ, uh, but then now we have to do our works to, to keep our salvation. No, that's another gospel which is not another gospel at all. It's something else, but it's not the pure gospel. Because when you dilute the gospel or you add to the gospel, it's not the gospel at all. Just like if you tell the truth, but you take some of the truth out or you add something else that's not true in, it's not truth at all. And the gospel is simply the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our faith in his works, not our own, settles salvation forever. And that's so very vitally important. That's why when he gets to verse 18, he says, these are enemies of the cross. Again, for many walk of whom I've told you often. And now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. They are the enemies. Hey, those who have never been born again are the enemies of Christ. They are the enemies of the cross. Hey, the cross is where our, our sins were paid for. It, they were atoned when Christ took that blood and laid it on the, the heavenly altar. It, 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 it paid for us. Listen, when he said it was finished, guess what? It was finished. It was a done deal. Those who live in the indulgence of sin, enemies of the cross. Those who have their interest in worldly affairs, enemies of the cross. Those who would not surrender to God's call to him. Enemies of the cross, those who are opposed to true doctrines of Christ, the doctrines of the word of God. Enemies of Christ, those who are opposed to Christian separation and service to him. Enemies of Christ. Enemies. Now he told us in the previous verse to mark those who are the examples for us. Those who walk uh, uh, pressing toward the mark those who walk seeking the Lord Jesus Christ, those who, 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 who walk with a, an eternity in view, looking for the resurrection, waiting for that precious moment when Christ will return. Listen to what he says in some other passages about Mark, marking people. He tells us not only to mark those who are good examples for us, watch, he tells us to mark those who are enemies of the cross. Take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 16 for just a moment. Can you turn there? Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Notice what he says about marking another kind of people. In Mark, in, in, Mark, in Romans chapter 16, verse 17, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, oh, not that are examples, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, Contrary to doctrine, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple, the hearts of those who are just a little ignorant, that don't know any better. Do you see that? Hey, we have religious people in abundance, in abundance. Some may even have Baptists on their, on their sign, or these days a little bit. It just says Baptist in a little small print sometimes. Or they say, well, we're Baptistic. We don't use the name to, share, to, 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 to scare people away. <laughs> Good. Now, don't put Baptist on your name if you're not going to be following the doctrines, the true doctrines of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, his teachings. He says, mark them, avoid them. They serve not the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 3.16. I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians 3.6. 2 Thessalonians 3.6. He says, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. And not after the tradition which he received of us. For ye yourselves know how you ought to follow us. 
For we, behaved our, we have not behaved ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not the power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. Now, we're to mark those who are examples, and we're to mark those who are going the wrong way. We have to know the difference between right and wrong. That's discernment. Discernment comes by taking the Word of God, believing the Word of God, receiving the Word of God, obeying the Word of God. According to Hebrews chapter 5, when we obey the Word of God, discernment comes. We begin to mature ourselves. It's by the, the, the uh, uh, experience. It's by the application of God's Word that we grow. Notice what he says in verse 20. Oh, this is tough. He says, for our conversation, I'm sorry, verse 19, he says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Now, that destruction, uh, Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now he's talking about the, 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 the tribulation time in Revelation 14. But it's the same kind of group of people it is that are enemies of the cross. Listen, you must be, believe on Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. No, that's adding to the gospel. Uh, baptism does not wash away our sins, but it gives us a a good confidence towards God that we're being obedient to Him. It's the first step of obedience. Yes, it's commanded that we be baptized. Not part of, not part of salvation. Not at all. Those who would say, oh, well, you have to be a part of our church and live a good life. And No, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saves us. And others would say, well, you know, you have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and then be a good person. No. We should be a good person. And once we receive Christ as Savior, we are transformed. And we have a new life. And yes, we are good people then. But we aren't good people in order to be saved. It turns us. It changes us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Listen to, to what Romans chapter 8, verse 5 says about these uh, whose end is destruction. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded or fleshly minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. We're in Romans 8. Listen to what he says in, in verse 7. He says... Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. How you doing? How's it working for you? Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, in their shame. Isn't that so true of those who don't know Christ as Savior? And they glory, they, they, they taunt it, they flaunt it. Um, homosexuality, drunkenness, uh, uh, cursing, it's flaunted. It, they glory in their shame. Oh, my friends, that's so true today, just as it was in the Apostle Paul's day, for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and I tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. The Judaizers, those who added to and changed the gospel, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Who mind earthly things. Colossians chapter 3. I like these precious verses. Good ones to memorize all the way through verse 5. That's a good section of, of, of me for memory verses. But he says in Colossians 3.1, if you, if you then be risen with Christ, seek 
those things which are above. The Apostle Paul is, is saying, hey, those who are enemies of the cross are earthly minded. They mind earthly things. He says, if you'll be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your own affections, your desires, set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. For you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Verse 4 is good. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. There's the prize, by the way. There's the prize. Oh, yeah, we're reaching toward that mark, pressing towards that mark. But the prize is when we're with Jesus Christ. He is our life. When he appears, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Those who are enemies of, cro of the cross, not only deny the cross, but oppose its work in their hearts. The gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, all for you, all for me. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says, And he, Jesus Christ, and he is the propitiation. That means the satisfaction, the atonement, okay? It satisfies God. It's the atonement for our sins, the payment for our sins. And he is the propitiation for our sins, but not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Jesus died for the wicked ones. That would be me. He died for those who are against him. That was me. He died for those who are good in their own sight, in their own righteousness, in their self-righteousness. That would be me. How about you? He died for you that you might have eternal life. His punishment he took. He says in verse 20, he says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our, our conversation. Hey, it's our life, all right? Uh, the way of our life, the way we're living our life out now is a heavenly life. It's not the earthly life. It's the one that has eternity in view. This is a walk of eternity. And we have that eternity in our minds with our purpose for eternity, not for now. That's why we walk the heavenly walk. This is our mark. Our conversation is in heaven. Oh, that's the mark. That's, that's where we're, we're reaching forward to. We're, we're focused upon that. We're going towards that. And he says, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, my dear friends, who shall change our vile body, that's our prize. Hallelujah, the resurrection. <laughs> that's it. We've talked about the mark. I press towards a mark for the prize. The prize is now that glorious resurrection when we in our Resurrected bodies will be in complete fellowship and harmony with God, living with Him, serving with Him. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, verse 21, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself our great God. Hey, let me read a passage in 1 Corinthians 15. Towards the end of that chapter, verse 42, talks about the resurrection over and again. But he says this, he says, So also the resurrection of the dead is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Do you see? It, 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 it's sown in corruption. The body is, is, is deteriorating. It it. it it gets worms, it, it, it decays, but it's going to be raised incorruptible, incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in, in a natural body, but it is raised in a spiritual body. Oh, the resurrection. That is the prize when we are raised again with him. That's the focus of this chapter is the resurrection. 
That's the prize. And those without Christ, those who would add to it, those who would say, no, you have to be circumcised, or you have to be baptized, or you have to be the, the, the member of a certain denomination, or you have to live a, a good life, and you have to... Wait, wait, wait. None of that. It's only by faith in Christ. But as many as received him, to, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I like the last part of verse 21. He says, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working, watch this. He says, whereby he is able. Is he? <laughs> he's able, he's able. I know he is able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He healed the brokenhearted, and he set the captive free. He made the lame to walk again, and he caused the blind to see. He's able, he's able. I know he is able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. How about you? Do you know that he is able? Whew. We have a mighty God. He is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That's what he does. He's the great creator, and he can bring all things to himself. Someone have said that he can change the mind and mold the heart into his own image in salvation. Has he done that? Is he doing that in you and through you? If he can change the mind and mold the heart into his own image, then he can also transform our bodies, our physical bodies in the resurrection to resemble his glorious body. Everything he makes can and is subject to his will. What a mighty God. What a mighty king. What a great I am is he. What a wonderful savior. How about you? Final questions. Two questions to go. How about you? Is this you? In verse 21, is this you? Are you walking with Christ with eternity in view? That's what we must, we must have it. Hey, that's why the, the sanctified life, the holy life, the walk in Christ is a heavenly walk. We're, we're practicing for heaven in this sin-cursed world. Let's be different. Let's be peculiar. Let's be busy walking with him, seeking and serving him. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Take it deep, challenge and change us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you.